The city of Philadelphia in Asia Minor was called the Gateway to the East, and it was strategically placed as a thoroughfare for travel. Therefore, many people traveled through the city. The church at Philadelphia was offered tremendous opportunity for ministry. And what we learn from this message that Jesus gives them is that God opened the door for ministry and they walked through it. Let's begin by observing what Jesus said to the church to this church in Revelation 3, 7 through 13. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. This is the message from the one who is holy and true, the one who has the key of David. What he opens, no one can close, and what he closes, no one can open. I know all the things you do, and I have opened a door for you that no one can close. You have little strength, yet you obeyed my word and did not deny me. Look, I will force those who belong to Satan's synagogue, those liars who say they are Jews but are not, to come and bow down at your feet. They will acknowledge that you are the ones I love. Because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God, and they will never have to leave it. And I will write on them the name of my God, and they will be citizens in the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Now, the church at Philadelphia stands on the complete opposite end of the spectrum from the church at Sardis. The church at Sardis was dead, as we already learned, and had fallen really far. We would not want to attend a church like that for sure. But the church at Philadelphia was alive and seemed to have God's favor poured out on it. You know, we can learn a lot from what Jesus says to this church, and it would be wise for us to choose a church like this to worship in. Philadelphia was surely a favored church and seemed to be doing things right. I don't know about you, but I strive to do things that are biblically right. I don't care if the culture or my inner circle balk at biblically right, but I care a lot, a lot. In the end, as you know, we're going to answer to Jesus, right? No one else. It seemed that the leaders in this church were driven by what was biblically right. First, let's talk about what Jesus says to this church in verse 7. This is the message from the one who is holy and true, the one who has the key of David. What he opens, no one can close, and what he closes, no one can open. This is a messianic prophecy from Isaiah 22, 22, where God said that he would give his servant Eliakim the highest position in the royal court. When he opens, when Eliakim opens doors, no one can shut them. And when he closes doors, no one can open them. In the message to the church at Philadelphia, Jesus shows us that he is the fulfillment of this messianic prophecy and that he is the only one who can open doors or shut them. What he opens, no one can shut and vice versa. You know, this is such a good reminder that we should wait and trust. Wait on him to open or close a door and trust in his timing and his purposes. It seemed that God opened a great door of ministry for this church and they walked through it. Jesus seemed very pleased with them. I've been in many churches and I can honestly say with everything inside of me that I can tell immediately if a church has the favor of God poured out upon it. You know, I go to a vibrant, alive church 
It's not a church that gets caught away by emotion, no. They are committed to bring us into the presence of God through strong worship and solid Bible teaching. As I worship there, I feel my heart awakened every week. Every church should be that way. Every church should be that way. But sadly, that isn't the case at all. I think that as we look deeper into the church at Philadelphia, we will see what, what brings God's favor. But as you examine Philadelphia further, take what you learn into your personal life. Because God not only pours out his favor on the church, but he also pours it out on people as well. The church at Philadelphia shows us what a favored church looks like. Here are three things. One, courage. Jesus says to them in verse eight, you have little strength, yet you have obeyed my word and did not deny me. The Greek word for deny is used to followers of Jesus who for fear of death or persecution, deny that Jesus is their master and desert his cause. This is so true of what's happening today. It seemed though that this church faced threats, yet they obeyed the Lord and didn't deny him when the pressures mounted. They did not deny him. This is courage and something that God sees as a beautiful gift that we can give to him. When we drift from the true gospel, we deny the authority of scripture and dismantle the word of God. We may not understand the repercussions of 21st century church, but church leaders continue to drift from the true gospel and they thus deny the authority of scripture. When Joshua was getting ready to lead the nation of Israel to conquer the promised land, God said to him in Joshua 1, 6 and 9, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. So think of yourself as a David walking down to face off with a nine foot giant and not cowering in intimidation, but standing your ground and mustering up enough courage to keep standing. God has given you the authority over the enemy for sure. The second feature to a favored church is strength. You know, this one may seem strange to you because of what Jesus says to them in verse eight, you have little strength, yet you obeyed my word and did not deny me. You see, it was actually their weakness that made them strong. And you may ask, well, how? Well, plainly speaking, they were strong in the Lord, not in themselves. Let's visit a popular passage that we have memorized. I know most of us have in Proverbs three, five and six. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. One problem that we see in church leaders and those who have been in ministry for years is that over time, it just seems to get easier. And it's then that we have a tendency to depend on ourselves our minds, our experiences, our opinions, and our work. We stop asking the Holy Spirit to guide us. We do. Our reliance on him becomes less and less. This is very common, but it's also very dangerous and will surely take us backward from strength to weakness. We need to be strong in the Lord, just like the church at Philadelphia. The third feature to a favored church is faithfulness. Jesus said to this church in verse 10, because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. They were faithful in obeying God's word. You know, I hope you have family and friends that are faithful to you. They're faithful to their words and their promises. You can count on them to be there no matter what's going on. Everyone needs faithful people in their lives. I have many. I can count on them and they know they can count on me. Faithfulness is a wonderful attribute. 
to attain. God loves those who are faithful, faithful to him with their actions, words, and trust, faithful to being obedient to his word. Those who are steadfast in their allegiance, devoted in their fidelity, and relentless in their godly pursuit surely bring down God's favor. God loves a faithful servant. In addition to Jesus showing them why they were favored and prosperous, in this message, he also tells them some encouraging things. Here are a few that I'm paraphrasing in my own words, words that apply to all of those who are favored. First, he will protect them from the great time of testing in verse 10, possibly a reference to the seven year tribulation. Second, if they keep holding on to what they have been given, their crowns will stay intact. You know, it's okay to protect those crowns. One day we'll be very glad that we did. And then this is what he says to those who are victorious. He says, those who are victorious will one day become pillars in the temple of God. Ooh. And one day they will never have to leave it. You know, that just makes me so happy because I love being in the presence of God. So imagine what it's going to be like in heaven when the worship is so much more, so much grander than anything that we've experienced on this earth. Those who are victorious, it says that Jesus will write on them God's name and that they will be citizens in the new Jerusalem, the city of God. Amen. Jesus will also write on them his new name. Wow. Beautiful things. All these things are great reasons why we should strive for God's favor. Amen.